In this episode of Podcast Tactics, you will discover how to turn your passion for a rich and storied culture into a very popular podcast. Listen in for tips on creating a travel show that's been taking its listeners on a journey for over six years. Remember to join the mailing list at podcasttactics.com to keep learning how to podcast from other podcasters. Now, let's get into it. Joining me right now is veteran podcaster Glenn Moyer from Keithville, Louisiana. Glenn, thank you so much for joining me on the show. My pleasure, and thanks for having me here. So let's jump right in. Tell us about your okay. podcast. What's the name of it, and what is it all about? In a word, it's about Scotland. The name is Under the Tartan Sky. And that actually came from a favorite movie of mine. Quick backstory, Under, Under the Tuscan Sun is a favorite movie of mine, and there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of inferences that I can draw from that. Under the Tuscan Sun is a story of a woman who goes through a midlife change, travels to a foreign country, falls in love with that country, decides to make her home there, and, and does. And I went through sort of a similar metamorphosis in my own life when I was in my, I'm now 67, so four or five years ago in 2013. I started falling in love with Scotland through a television show that I was watching, strangely enough, and decided I would really like to go there and see that. And I have known all of my life I had Scottish ancestry, but I never really explored it. And so I started doing that, started getting involved with Scottish groups on Twitter and Facebook, et cetera, made that first trip to Scotland in 2014, fell in love with the place, started a blog to keep up with my, to let my friends know about my travels, you know, how people, friends and family, oh, well, post pictures, tell us what you're doing and this and that. So I thought, well, the smartest, the easiest way to do it was a blog. And I really enjoyed that. And when I got back, I faced this conundrum that, you know, I really enjoyed that. And I wanted to continue sharing my excitement for Scotland, but you can't write a travel blog if you're not traveling to a country. And at that <laughs> point, I was not. I'm I didn't know that I would eventually be going back every year, which I do now. But so I fell back on my broadcasting background and I thought, well, if I can't travel to Scotland and I can't write about it because I'm, I've run out of things to write about that I've experienced personally, I know I can talk with people. I've been in the media, radio and television for most of my professional career. And I thought, I can do interviews and I can talk with, you know, with Skype and those sorts of things we had then before Zencaster and Squadcast and these things we have now, even with Skype, I thought, well, I can interview anyone in Scotland about anything, anytime. And so the, the blog quickly begat the podcast. And, and so that's the long story. My, my apologies for the story behind the name and what the podcast is all about. I say, it's under the tartan sky. It's all things Scottish from bagpipes to whiskey. We cover it all. <laughs> the whiskey part. I'm, I'd love to pick your brain on that part. But uh, before we get into that, I want to take a few steps back here and talk a little sure. bit about your, your journalism and broadcasting background. What capacity were you working in that field? Virtually everything. I started right as I got out of high school. I started studying radio, television, and film in college and started my second year, I think, in college, the, uh, the university did not have a radio station, but started one that was a closed circuit broadcast strictly from the radio studio into the student union. The next year, it did get a, uh, a public broadcast uh, radio station. So I started there as a, a commentator disc jockey. And then I went to work in the commercial market in my hometown. Uh, I got an internship at the local TV station, ended up being hired by them as a news reporter and sports anchor. And so cool. through the career, then I, I went on and worked at a number at a variety of radio stations initially as a disc jockey, but I wasn't the best disc jockey in the world. And I've always had a real interest in news. And so um, one of my program directors said, you know, you're not the best disc jockey, but we need a news department. So you're now the news department. And that got me started in radio news. And so I went on from there and worked throughout Texas. I grew up in a town called Beaumont, Texas, about 80 miles east of Houston. So I started there, moved to San Antonio, and then eventually up to Dallas, Texas. And uh, spent about almost 20 years in the broadcast business in various, uh, being a, a reporter, an on an on camera anchor, being a, an assignments editor, a producer, um, 
chief cook and bottle washer. Yeah, done a little bit of it all and disc jockey and radio news as well. So done a little bit of everything. Yeah, I will say uh, the quality of your podcast is a uh, it, it seems to be a direct reflection of your experience in the field I, from the first uh, note of your intro music to hearing your, the timbre of your voice from <laughs> the intro. I was like, whoa, OK, this is some high quality stuff that is going on here. I don't want to talk about your episode quite yet. The one that I listened to, you know, I, okay. I do want to kind of keep it a little high level. But yeah, your show is, it seems to be very well researched. Uh, the quality of it is really high. You know, how, you know, obviously I feel like that comes from your journalism background. Stupid question time. Is that true? <laughs> it does. And, uh, and that's an excellent, <laughs> if uh, not obvious, perhaps observation. <laughs> Yeah. The first thing when I decided to start doing, I mean, I had played in podcasting in a really unusual way. I, I did a small little podcast that was basically just a, a recorded newscast for the Balloon Federation of America, who I also work for doing a, a magazine. And then I was hired by a, an online aviation news outfit to be their audio podcaster. And I got that job because I had done these little news podcasts for the balloon group. But when I started to launch Under the Tartan Sky, what I feel is like my first real podcast, one of the first things I read was the listening experience has to be a good one. People don't want, are not going to listen to bad audio. And my days in radio, you know, I've always had very high production values, music and uh, music cuts have got to butt together or, or segue together well. They've got to blend. You know, volume levels have to be maintained, have to be, excuse me, have to be, I talk with my hands, have to be consistent throughout. So I do pay a lot of attention to what I call production values on my show. I spend an inordinate amount of time probably editing my interviews. I cut out lip smacks and uhs and ahs. And if someone says, well, that, 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 you know, that, that, well, I'll cut all those, that, 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 that's out to just one that so that the conversation flows better. So, yeah, thank you for noticing that. And I, I, I appreciate that because production values are very, very important to me. Yeah. And I think it's because it's important to the listener. Yeah. It's definitely, you know, from a, from a technical standpoint, your show is a gem like that. Like it's something to that I would aspire to, right? I mean, gosh, well, I hope I can, you. you know, do right by you when I put this episode together. <laughs> I feel like oh, my palms are sweaty with. No, but let's talk a little bit about some challenges that you. Hold on a second before I ask that question. How long has your podcast been around? Um, in June, I'll mark my sixth anniversary. So I'll be doing it. Have been doing it for six years. Come June. Okay, so. Over the years, I mean, you clearly are experienced doing this with podcasting. What are some of the challenges that you've encountered and how have you broken through those challenges? Well, um, I don't know that I've broken through them. The biggest challenge that I face to this day is consistency. I, in all these different Facebook groups that you and I are in, you read about people saying, well, what's the best day to release? Is it Wednesdays or Thursdays or, you know, and is there a certain hour of time? And do you have to come out every week, every on the same day, the same time and all that? I don't do any of that in part because my show is an interview show and it is a hobby. It's not monetized in any sense of the word. And I do have a daytime job. So my biggest challenge is scheduling guests. And getting the production done on a routine basis. And I am not good at that. I have not been good at that. I started out thinking my show would be a weekly show. Then I thought, okay, uh, I'll put out every other week. And then it became, you know, once a month. And then it was like, well, whenever I can get somebody, I'll get them. And, and really, that's the way it is. And as a result, my listenership has always stayed fairly low. I've peaked at about 12,000 listeners, but I run on average around five to 6,000 because I'm not consistent. And that is my biggest fault. And I freely admit it. And I have not found a way to break through that. I don't, I, I could hire someone full time, a producer, if you will, to research and seek out guests and book them and schedule them and make sure that after I did an interview yesterday, which for an episode I'll be releasing on Monday. 
I don't have anything else lined up after that. I have several guests that I've been talking with, a couple that we've had to reschedule, but I have nothing scheduled on the books. And so that's my challenge is to try and find a way to be consistent. And in six years of doing this, I haven't figured it out yet. So you are human. (laughs) <laughs> very much so <laughs> that's kind of, yeah. very much so yeah let's look at the flip side of things here Let, let's talk so uh, you know let's talk a little bit about what it is that you love about podcasting what where, where do you find the joy oh well for me one i always enjoyed radio i worked in both radio and television but i always loved the medium of radio uh, i love being where i am right now behind a microphone and relating to people whether i can see them or not I think it's easier to relate to people through audio, uh, through radio, than it is television. Uh, the camera creates a barrier that you, some people just never get comfortable with. So I enjoy that. The great joy for me about my podcast and what it allows me to do is that I can pick up the phone and, or send an email and reach out to someone. And I have met the most amazing people who have been my guest that I would never have crossed paths with, you know, in the ordinary routine of my life. Doogie McLean, for example, is, he is, for example, sort of a James Taylor of the Scottish music world, grossly, hugely famous singer songwriter. And I got an email once from a, a PR agency about a festival he runs. And I sent him an email and said, Hey, I do this little podcast. And, you know, I'd love to have Doogie thought it'll never happen. They said, great. We set it up. And we had such a great conversation. It turned out to be two hour long episodes. And that's just one example. The guy who is Andy Scott is the sculptor of the world's largest equine sculpture, a a sculpture of two horses in Scotland called the Kelpies. Uh, And again, a friend of mine said, hey, you ought to reach out to him. I found him on Facebook, sent him a message. He said, sure. We had a great episode with him. And so I've made, and a number of my guests are people that I've gone on to when I've traveled to Scotland, I've met them in person. We've become very close friends. So the relationship has gone well beyond just them appearing one time on my podcast. We now are, I presume, lifelong friends to be. And so that's the joy for me is meeting those people and being able to share. I have a real passion for Scotland and my ancestry. And so being able to share, being an ambassador for an unofficial ambassador for the country of Scotland and all that I find great about it and wonderful about it and want to tell people about the podcast gives me that platform. Mm. On that note, let's, let's jump into an episode discussion here. I I listened to the, uh, a breed apart. I hope it's one that uh, I can remember. (laughs) It's, I believe it's the most recent one, actually. It was the Ereske Pony Oh, yeah, episode. the Ereske Ponies. Yeah, yeah. 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 Like I said, the, qual- the research, the depth at which you are going into Scottish culture it, it, is absolutely wonderful. You know, this is, I learned something from your podcast about this Good. breed of horse. Uh, very fascinating. Your guest was wonderful as well. I mean, your interview style was fantastic, too. Thank you. So I'm just, you know, that's my fanboy moment here. I'm just gushing about, you know, the quality (laughs) of your, of your show. It's okay. Gush a little more. (laughs) Bring it. He says, yeah. Talk to me about the level at which you go into researching each of your episodes. How, how, it seems like it's a lot and I want to get a sense from you. Is that true or how, how deep do you? It may not be as much as you think it is. I benefit from the fact that I've now been to Scotland five times. I have a tremendous network of friends and contacts there, but it, it, it's like anything else. And I'm trying to remember where I came across the Ereske ponies. I don't recall at the moment how I initially learned about them, but often it's something I'll pick up on social media. It'll be, there'll be something on Twitter, for example, and I'll go, oh, well, that sounds interesting. And, and I'll start to look at it. I'll find people talking about that subject matter and start to pick little facts and, and, issues and ideas from that. And then I'll look for an authority type person that can be the interview for the podcast. And then I do like anyone else. I Google and start to read everything I can find on the internet. Sometimes I only have a day or two to do all that research within. Other times I may have a week or so to really get a little more in-depth into it. So the the subject matter specifically, yeah. I'll Google and read as much online as I can. 
I've got a number of books in my library here about Scotland, and, and I'm involved with my friends there. Also, a lot of the the culture, the day to day background about Scotland is stuff that has become ingrained in me through my travel experiences there and my friendships there. But on the specific subject, I will do as much research as time allows. And when I started the podcast, as I said, it, it dawned on me that unlike when you're writing a travel blog, I, you have to sort of do the research and then impart all the information. Well, the nice thing about my interview show is I only really have to know enough to ask the right questions. I don't have to know the answers. I'm not an expert on Ariske ponies or on the Kelpies or uh, on tartan or whiskey or anything else, but I do have to educate myself enough to ask the right questions. And, and I'm, uh, I'll give myself a pat on the back that I think I do that fairly well. Do you have a, a, a secret sauce for asking the right question? <laughs> I mean, what, you know, like help us out with that one. I really don't. I, I guess it, it comes from having been doing interviews since my, you know, college days. And I've always had an, an ability to a, a quick war story. I got into broadcasting when I was in high school. I went to college on a debate scholarship. I've always done a public speaking competition. And so that helped me. I did extent, what they call extemporaneous speaking, where in tournaments, you go into a room and you draw five topics that you draw five little slip like fortune slips of paper each one with a different topic on it and you pick which one you want to speak on and you have like 15 minutes to prepare a five minute speech on it so i've always had this ability to assimilate information very quickly and to impart it very quickly my strength as a as a news reporter was live reporting because i'm i have a real talent and i don't mean to toot my own horn but you can put me in a situation and turn the microphone on and say go and I will go and I, and I have an ability to talk about what I see and what's happening around me and impart that information until you tell me to stop. I have a, an absolute hatred of people who say, who allow dead air in broadcasting, for example. You got to fill it with something. Say something. Fill the void. So I, I guess my interview talent comes from just literally those years and years and years and years of, of doing it. I remember a post in the the group that we're on in, in Facebook that talked about, and, and I printed it out and keep it here beside me somewhere about five basic questions to ask that like, that are great for getting, I don't ever use them, but I thought, you know, someday I might. So no, I, I don't have an answer for it. It, I would just say it's a talent that I've developed over years doing interviews. And I couldn't tell you how I do it or why I do it or why it works, but it seems to work. At least if people like yourself who are listening to the podcast are enjoying those interviews, then that tells me it's working. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting to hear your take on it just because it's so natural for you. It's so ingrained in your DNA. Um, yeah. It's like public speaking. A lot of people you know, are scared to death of public speaking. Well, I've been uh, in my role in ballooning. I'm an event announcer at balloon festivals all around. I've been the voice of the Albuquerque Balloon Fiesta for 30-something years now. Putting me in front of a crowd of people and say, talk, is no big deal. But some people go, you know, stage fright, and, and they get dry mouth and can't say a word. So it's all about talent. Now, ask me to draw something? <laughs> it ain't going to happen. I can't draw stick people, you know? <laughs> so drawing is not my talent. Talking apparently is, and, and it's good I got into hot air blending because I guess I'm full of hot air. <laughs> I want to just go a little bit further on the, the, the conversational or the talking part of it, too, because I feel like something that, is, that you're not really saying, too, in your style is that listening part, you know, the, the being able to listen to your guest and, and, and respond to the conversation that you're having, you know, respond to what they're sharing with you. You know, you don't, I, I'm assuming you don't go in with a script or maybe you do, you have some guardrails up, but you know, the conversation really dictates the direction of, you know, the interview is, is that a fair assessment there? It is. And, and you're right. I don't go in with a script. I do go in with um, bullet points or actually I generally start each interview for the podcast with a list of like 10 questions. Okay that I have pre-written for myself so that there are high points that I want to be sure that I cover with my guests. I don't always do them in the order that they're, you know, I don't go one, two, three, four, five, six. And if the answer to question number three 
is something I didn't int- didn't think about, or it makes me think, you know, I'm not afraid to go off on a tangent or to explore another area. And you're right. That's where coming into, you can't just, you can't be a good interviewer just by asking questions. Anyone can sit down and write a list of 10 questions. And if all I did were to ask those 10 questions, the interviews would be very boring. You have to be able to listen and hear and comprehend and and take in what your guest is, what their answers are, what they're telling you. And that very often leads to the next question or a question you hadn't thought about, or it makes you change the order of the questions you had prepared. Question number 10 suddenly becomes relevant because of an answer to question number two. So you move it up into the order of things. So yeah, you have to be a good listener in order to be a good interviewer. No, I, I just, you know, I want to thank you, like, just right off the bat here, because you're, there's so much great advice that's, I'm getting from well, you, I and, so. and I hope all the less listeners are getting that as well. If you're talking to somebody who is interested in starting a podcast, or they're, you know, just getting underway, like I am, what is the one piece of advice that you would want to give to them? Interestingly enough, I just talked with a, a good friend who's starting a new podcast. I was helping her research microphones. Um, I think it's, it's, it's something I learned when I first decided I wanted to be uh, a writer years ago. And that bit of advice was write what you know about. And so if you're going to do podcasting, my first advice is podcast about something you have a passion for. I wouldn't be any good doing a podcast about horror movies because I hate horror movies. They scare the, you know, what out of me and I, and I won't watch them. Um, and so, you know, find what it is that you have a passion for either, either a passion because you're involved in it and you know it, you know, from A to Z or a passion like I have with Scotland, that it's something I want to learn more and more and more about, you know, keep, you know, as, What's the running back? Ezekiel Levis says, you know, feed me, you know, just keep feeding me. I'm kind of that way about Scotland. So my advice is if you're going to start a podcast, find a subject that you are passionate about that. And that passion will be long burning. It can't be a flash in the pan because if it is, you'll go for a few months or maybe a year or two, and then you'll, you'll give up, you'll burn out, find your passion and make that your podcast. So with a back catalog of yours, you know, the six years that you've been doing this, if there is one episode that you want to point somebody at, what sticks out in your mind as, yeah, that's the one that people should go and listen to? <laughs> um, well, there, there are two. The one that people go to is an episode that I did about a lady in Scotland who makes incredible jewelry out of sea glass. She collects the sea glass on the beaches and then goes back. And a lot of people who do sea glass jewelry just take silver wire and wrap it around the piece of glass and call it jewelry. She literally carves and creates incredible creations. She's done butterflies and dolphins and just on and on and on and on. anything you can think of. She, she actually carves it out of sea glass and hearts and moons and on and on. That is and has been my most popular episode ever since I put it out on the air. And it's three years old now, I think. Uh, It continues to be my number one listened to episode. It's not my favorite. It's one of them. My favorite is one with a lady who, again, has become a very dear friend of mine over in Scotland. We met on one of my more recent trips. And she she wrote her debut novel. It took her 22 years to write this novel. She started writing it at a point when she was in a bad marriage. Uh, The marriage broke up. She took her baby son, infant son, then moved away, started a new life. uh, And over the years, went back to the book and wrote a bit and put it away, went back to it and back to it. And she was an incredible interview. She had such passion and such, it was the most fun conversation I have ever had. I think in my life, the book is called dancing through fire. And the lady's name is Catherine Alexandra, and that episode is a couple of years old now. She has uh, since gone through some more difficulties in her life. Her husband has had a very uh, debilitating injury, illness, and she went from having, she self-published this first novel. She started working on the second, and then she sort of changed career goals again and now runs a 
a unique catering business in Scotland. So I keep bugging her about, well, you know, don't make me wait 22 more years for the next novel. And her novel, it was about it's women's fiction. It's almost a romance novel, but not the type where the, with the guy has flowing hair to his waist and muscles and all sure. not that kind of romance novel, but it was a romantic novel, I guess is the way to say it. And, and I read it on the recommendation of a mutual friend. It was not a book I would normally pick up and read. And I fell in love with her writing style. She can write with such, she paints pictures with words. She's just an excellent writer. It's a shame she isn't doing more writing. Um, but that is by far my favorite episode. And the one that I I say, if you want to hear me at my best and one of my best interviews and one of the most fun and unique podcast episodes I've done, that's the one I point to. That sounds like a great one. I, you know, I have to ask you, Glenn, because like, I don't know when I'm going to have another opportunity to speak with you again. Oh, we can chat anytime. How how about a whiskey, whiskey recommendation? Ah, well, okay. (laughs) First of all, I am not, I've never been a drinker. And when I have what alcohol I have liked, I, I tend to be a sweet drinker. I always liked margaritas, pina coladas, although my, I won't bore you with the long story, but my first drink when I was 18 years old was scotch offered to me by an Italian uncle. And I thought it tasted like kerosene. In fact, I, I poured it into a plant when he wasn't looking. <laughs> uh, and that was, that was scotch uh, whiskey. But my drinking whiskey started when I decided to go to Scotland and explore my heritage. I thought I'm not going to go to Scotland and go to a pub and not be able to have a dram of whiskey and enjoy it. So I, I asked, found friends that were whiskey drinkers and got their recommendations and started sampling it. And I'm still learning, but I'm very much of the Speyside region whiskey, which is a lighter, fruitier, sweeter, if you will, whiskeys than I don't like heavily peated whiskeys. I don't like really smoky whiskeys. And there are six or seven different regions of whiskeys around Scotland, and they all have their own various characteristics. So Speyside is an area where the the whiskeys tend to be lighter and a fruitier is kind of the way they're described. My favorite of all of those is is a Glenmorangie whiskey, and uh, it's called Nectar Dior. And I actually first sampled it at a pub in Albuquerque, New Mexico during the Balloon Fiesta. I was reading their whiskey list. I saw it, read the description. It sounded great. And it has become my favorite whiskey. It's almost, if there is such a thing, it's almost a dessert whiskey. It's a very easy, very flavorful. Everyone that I've ever recommended it to really, really likes it. So I think it's a great uh, whiskey for someone to start with. Absolutely. Fantastic. But it's, it's, still, it's still my favorite. So <laughs> Glenn Morangy, um, Nectar Dior. Thanks for entertaining my question there. <laughs> sure. Let me, I, let me, I can, we can have a we can have a whole conversation about that because there's Balvenies that I'm uh, Caribbean cask that I particularly like. There's a Jura that is a great whiskey. There's several of them out there, so we could do a whole thing on whiskey. But I was going to say the same thing. There's all, that sounds like a whole other podcast episode there. Let me it's steer the whole us back podcast to your, subject, to be honest. Right. Yeah. yeah, that's actually yeah. a good point. Oh, there we go. I think we hit on our next yeah, uh, concept Somebody out here. there should be doing a podcast <laughs> about whiskey. Yeah, because then you get into the, you know, the, the scotch whiskey, which is malted barley, and then you have you know, bourbon and, and corn and rye whiskey and those kinds of things we make here in the States. And, and what's, what's whiskey? Is it whiskey with an E or without? Yeah. I mean, there's a whole <laughs> podcast to be done right there. Well, let's talk about your podcast. I am curious to know, what is it that you want people to get out of your podcast? Why should they listen, listen to your show? Well, they're probably not going to listen if they don't have an interest uh, on some level in Scotland, um, whether it's its culture, its people, whiskey, tartan, music, or whatever. So that's kind of a prerequisite, and that naturally keeps my audience I think to certainly keeps me from becoming, you know, having thousands and tens and tens and twenties and hundreds of thousands of listeners. Although there are um, several million Scott diaspora people of Scottish descent all around the world, the potential for a, a multi million you know, audience is out there, but I, I don't ever expect to achieve that. What I hope comes across in the podcast is my love for Scotland and my desire to share that with my listeners. And I hope that, you know, if they come to the podcast because they have an interest in Scotland, I hope they go away learning something like you mentioned with the Arisca ponies. And, and I do cover, you know, literally 
bagpipes to whiskeys. We've done shows on, on bagpipes and on whiskey and on food and drink and on tartan and Harris Tweed and music and um, you name it. And I've probably done a, at least one episode on it. So I, I just hope people come to the show to learn something about Scotland. And when they leave, I hope they feel like they've learned something. You know, I hope they, they walk away knowing something or with a curiosity to go learn something further uh, than what I've, I've, you know, open their mind to, to looking at Scotland, maybe in a new light and, and taking away something from that. I'm not sure that was a very good answer, but. Oh yeah, absolutely. It was okay. so, like we said before, I mean, you've been going at this for six years. Let's go six years in the future. What are, what are your hopes for your podcast? Um, I would hope that it's more consistent. I hope that I would hope that I could achieve a consistency. I, I'm trying to maintain I, I was trying to maintain once every fortnight or every two weeks, but that's becoming problematic. If I can do once a month, I think I, that might be the, the goal to target for. But I would hope that I would find some consistency. I'm quite happy with the, the production value, with, with the podcast quality overall, the quality of guests. I hope I can just continue. I know there's, there's material out there. There's certainly no shortage of, of topic and subjects about Scotland to, to talk about. And my ultimate goal, honestly, is to, is to immigrate and make my home in Scotland. There are a lot of reasons why that hasn't happened and may never happen. I don't know. Um, but I guess six years from now, if I had a, an ultimate wish list, it, it would be that I would be doing my podcast from uh, a small cottage somewhere up in the in the highlands of scotland Ooh, that would be the base that sounds really cool yeah so one more question before i let you go glenn sure. what is the best experience that's happened as a result of your podcast the absolute but no question i did a podcast i did an episode um a friend put me in touch with a, a mutual a, a friend put me in touch with her friend in scotland who runs Loch Ness water, which is a bottled drinking water where the water literally comes from Loch Ness. And in doing that podcast, not only did I meet he and his partner and have they become good friends, but in doing that podcast and searching through their corporate website, they had done a corporate tartan. And there was a, a bit on their website about the lady who designed their tartan. Turns out she was a tartan designer, figure that out. And, and as I read about her, I thought, wow, she would be an interesting interview for the podcast. So I got in touch. She agreed. She came on the podcast. We developed a, an immediate friendship. A few months after I had had her on the episode, I was in Scotland. We made plans to, to meet. We met personally. I met her and her husband, visited what was then her uh, small design studio, which was in basically what they call in Scotland, a shack. It was just an outbuilding office from their home and immediately started up a relationship that resulted in her designing my very own tartan. I have my own Glen Moyer tartan that is registered with the Scottish Tartans Authority. She has gone on to build quite a name for herself. She is, has opened, it has crowdfunded remodeling an old farmsteading that's on their property into what will be a fully integrated tartan weaving mill, but she's opened up a, a temporary location uh, for the last few years now. So she not only designed, but I had her weave and create my tartan for me. And that friendship that came from, from that purely accidental interview, you know, in interview that I did for a different episode and, and stumbled upon her and her story and the, the friends that we have become since then. That's clearly been the most, and having my own tartan. And we're actually now, and I haven't released this anywhere else. So here's a, a little plug for you. We are actually designing a, a tartan for Under the Tartan Sky. The podcast will eventually have its own officially registered tartan. So that relationship with, with her and her company and her family, that's been the most um, extraordinary thing that's come from my podcast. That's wonderful. Glenn, please tell us where people can learn more about you and your podcast. 
Well, that's easy. I don't use a host. I, I have my own website for the podcast and host my episodes there. So simply um, go to the website, which is www.underthetartansky.scott. It's not a .com or a .net or .org. It's .scott. And strangely enough, a quick plug, I'm the U.S. Global Ambassador for .scott, which is a Scottish online registry. And so anyone with Scottish inclinations or affiliations or a love of Scotland, you can have a dot Scott website. And my site is it's under the tartan sky dot Scott. There's my, a little bit of background there. All the podcast episodes are there for each episode. As you've probably seen, I also write a small, um, my show notes are more of a blog post that go into more detail about the show. And usually there are photographs since the show itself is audio only. There are photographs in the blog post that accompanies the the episode so that people get a better sense of what the episode was all about. So yeah, go to the website under the tartan sky dot Scott. I also have a Facebook page of the same name under the tartan sky dot Scott and a public Facebook page, a Glen in Scotland, where I share a lot of general information about Scotland as well. So those are three places, or you can find me on Twitter at Glen Moyer one. And of course, at under the tartan sky. So all those places. And, and we're on Insta- I'm on Instagram too. Same thing. So Glenn, I'd love to keep in touch with you and maybe catch up down the road six months or so. Maybe we can, you know, do another follow-up interview if that'd be all right with you. I, I would be happy to. I'm happy to chat with you anytime, James. And, uh, and I look forward to finding out more about your show and, and I, I'm going to definitely tune in to see this one to see how you treat me. <laughs> <laughs> I will um, do you justice, but, hopefully. <laughs> but one of the things I've done, uh, again, not to belabor the point, is, is uh, my next episode, by the way, is, with, uh, is an interview with a lady who's just launched a new podcast I, oh. about Scotland. So I often interview other podcasters that are podcasting about Scotland because that's what's relative to my audience. So I love sharing other podcaster stories just as you're doing. So I, I applaud you for what you're doing, and I'm anxious to see how it develops. The name of the show is Under the Tartan Sky. Glenn, I could keep going with you. I mean, this is a fantastic conversation. You've got you know so many wonderful stories with your podcast. I love the world that you immerse us in. Keep going. Um, you know, without a doubt, you will. But I look forward to you know diving into some more of your episodes. Well, thank you. And as you can tell, I'm, I'm, uh, I have no shortage of words. <laughs> so uh, anytime you want to have another chat, I'd be happy to. I, I fear I'd keep you too long probably, but yes, we could go on and on and on. Get me talking about Scotland and I won't shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks again, Glenn. I wish you all the My continued success. Thank you and best of luck to you as well. Thanks again to Glenn. Check the show notes for links to learn more about him and his podcast, Under the Tartan Sky. I would love to hear what you got out of this episode. Leave a review on podchaser.com to let me know. The show notes has info for how to do this and feel free to make suggestions for what I can do to make this show even better for you. And make sure you subscribe and follow Podcast Tactics to learn even more about podcasting in future episodes. Thank you.